Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Big Ideas on the Go. Uh, we're excited to have with us somebody uh, from the public sector, uh, Jamie Grant, the Chief Information Officer for the state of Florida. Uh, Jamie, hello, and welcome uh, to Big Ideas on the Go. Thanks. Really excited to be here. So, Jamie, you know, this is a little bit of a departure for us. Uh, you know, historically, we've had a lot of people from industry, so more the commercial sector. So it'd be great to get uh, a little bit of kind of your point of view with regards to kind of data, data compliance and kind of regulatory. Certainly, there's a number of regulations, even in the state of Florida, uh, which is now my home state as well, um, that organizations need to comply with. But first... Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about you. How did you get into this role? What's your background? Yeah, so so I like to say that I kind of failed my way here. A um, couple of things I, I stress. Uh, this is the first and this is the first government job I've ever had. It's the only government job I intend to have. Um, kind of made a, a, a an interesting transition, but uh, was a lawyer. I guess technically still am recovering, so don't hold it against me, but practiced for about uh, about two years and realized why the suicide rate was so high and, and wanted out badly. Um, one of the things I did uh, a lot of was business representation and, and uh, civil litigation and, and actually represented a number of tech clients uh, that started opening some doors to, to, to make my way into the industry. Um, prior to that, I had actually failed at the, the coaching profession as badly as I think you possibly could in, in college, trying to coach college football. And so I uh, ended up going to law school uh, like I said, didn't really enjoy that. Uh, ran for office, um, almost a, a little bit on a dare from a, if you think it could be done so much better and and, and modernized, then why don't you go show us how it's done? And and then won, and so I had to show up. And, and so my friends now like to joke that I've, I've made the transition from a full-time entrepreneur and part-time legislator in Florida to a full-time bureaucrat that uh, works inside of government. Uh, that in-between space, uh, I spent uh, about seven and a half years uh, with a healthcare startup, uh, tech and services startup that we scaled from about four to 400, uh, scaled internationally, um, trying to disrupt a, another super bureaucratic space in, in the healthcare space, uh, but kind of a private sector guy doing a tour of service embedded in government, which uh, has been an interesting collision sometimes with, with the agency and, and kind of status quo of, of government. Look, I imagine there's there's a lot to navigate, and, and governments are not known for their efficiency. Although I believe it's a little bit different in Florida. So, look, you know, Big ID is obviously not obviously, but Big ID is very focused on data, data compliance, data security. Um, you know, give us your point of view around uh, data and the role of data um, in uh, state government. So, I think there's a, a, a few kind of guiding principles. Um, one, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in privacy and decentralization. Um, so I think one of the things that government often gets wrong uh, is the um, kind of the proclivity to build a, a castle and an empire and, and just keep stacking, um, you know, almost like a vertical architecture of just make this thing bigger and bigger and bigger and more dependent on all of the layers underneath it. And I think when you look at what's happening, both, um, I, I kind of make the parallel that the state's chief information security officer, so cybersecurity who reports to me, uh, and then the state chief data officer, uh, we're, we're currently recruiting that. So if you've got listeners uh, or folks that are interested in sending somebody in, even on a tour of service to come be the chief data officer of a $112 billion enterprise and build out um, wow. enterprise data capabilities, uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can uh, find my email. I'm happy, but, but we are open and actively recruiting that role. Um, commercial aside, Dimitri, those two roles kind of play what I, I kind of say is my offensive coordinator, my defensive coordinator. My, my CISO is there to, to play defense, to make sure that bad guys don't you know, do things to the state enterprise. The chief data officer needs to go on offense to make sure that we can do um, kind of just basic data calls and find efficiencies that help drive a better and smarter government operation. One of the examples I give um, when I talk about the need for, I, I'll say API as a service, and that I know that can, can sound cliche to listeners in the space, but um, you know, government still has, we still have a mainframe. This is the first job I've ever had where I had to care about a mainframe and understand how a mainframe works. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm not old enough to, to appreciate COBOL coming up in the industry, right. Or, or to have to have previously dealt with mainframes. Um, so when I, when I uh, kind of take a look at it, um, you can't protect the enterprise if you don't go all the way back to the single data element, trace it back. Who owns it? Who manages it? Where is it? Where is it hosted? What does it do? What is who's dependent on? All those kind of rudimentary questions. If you want to do security, you better have really good insight at the data element level. 
if you want to do modernization, right? Like how do we retire a mainframe? How do we get government out of the business of building and developing software and into the business uh, of, you know, fully transitioning from CapEx to OpEx models everywhere we can? We also have to get all the way back to the data element um, to make sure we do that. So that's why those two roles to me are so complementary. Um, some people seem at opposite ends of the spectrum, but but the state CISO should be, uh, their life should be a lot easier by the enterprise data catalog um, and data sharing work that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And simultaneously, if the state CISO is doing what it takes to secure each and every data element for the constituents we serve, uh, that ought to make the chief data officers uh, life a lot easier. And then if we roll all that up into that macro strategy, when I talk about kind of decentralized and, and privacy focused, um, you know, a decentralized strategy limits the blast radius if something happens for my uh, cybersecurity part of the shop. Uh, decentralized and containers strategy uh, helps my chief data officer do modernization much more quickly uh, and in an agile fashion where government is still doing kind of these procurements of 10 year, $200 million waterfall type projects that, you know, newsflash continue to run on over budget over time and under deliver the promise for the constituents we serve. So that's probably a little more than you were asking for, but, well, but, I'm actually, uh, but there's, yeah, I actually wouldn't mind double clicking on one of those things. You talk about kind yeah. of decentralization and the importance of that. So obviously a state is an amalgam of different agencies and you have kind of a global uh, statewide uh, CISO soon, soon hopefully CDO, one of our listeners actually may have a candidate for you. I'll, I'll talk offline, but I, I am curious about how much do you impose on each of the agencies, a structure where this is how you will go about in terms of a standardized catalog, a standardized, you know, DLP or data or kind of an internal threat protection solution for, and how much do you say, you know, you guys do whatever you want, but here's some gui guidelines. Yeah, so that's the toughest part of this job, man. When when you take over a a fundamentally decentralized uh, ecosystem, getting to a level of standardization is the hard part. And for folks who maybe don't know, and and you really wouldn't know unless you were in government, selling to government in Florida, this space specifically. But Florida, you know, typically leads the nation on policy areas. Uh, education, healthcare, those kind of things. When the legislature or the governor signs something, it tends to to, to uh, spread through the country as reforms that were positive that demonstrated results. Uh, there's actually been four uh, iterations of the state technology office in some form or fashion that have all been abolished because they have uh, just failed to meet the mark. We're the fifth. And so, um, you know, when you take over this almost anarchy, you know, there, there's no standards across the enterprise. How do you get there? Um, I don't believe in a heavy centralization strategy to, to, to governance uh, of the enterprise the same way I don't believe in you know, a, a centralized database uh, for, for all of the state data. To get there, you really have to develop those standards. And what does like, an integrated marketplace look like? Um, it, it's admittedly hard, Dimitri. It's the hardest job that I have because it would, it would honestly be easier to have the agencies or have us just outsource cybersecurity operations to some systems integrator that brings a $200 million tab to us, makes the decisions on the stack, and then goes through all the agencies and say, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Instead, what we've done is say, we're going to have this integrated marketplace that has standards. So I've kind of bet my, 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 uh, my credibility through the enterprise on kind of a hub to serve in the cybersecurity space as both the single point of access and translation for what these different platforms would call different indicators of uh, like whether it's an indicator of compromise side uh, or a capability side and 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 standardizing it in one centralized place, but allowing those spokes to operate. And I could spend a lot of time talking about, but, but I use endpoint detection as, as an example. There's lots of endpoint detection solutions in the marketplace, lots of good ones. I'm not gonna go buy five of them for the enterprise. But at the point I come in, I have some agencies who have already implemented, let's say, uh, an endpoint solution that is not the one we picked for the enterprise. We had to pick one or two. I typically pick two vendors uh, in the government space so that I'm never dependent on one or held hostage by one. Yeah. Um, but let, let's say we're going to support five. And so we pick two and there's there's three others that are already out in the ecosystem. I could go to the agency and say, hey, you picked one of the three and you're actually doing endpoint, which I need you to do. But I need you to rip it out and re-implement something else. I've now made their life more difficult. I, I, I've just, it's it's bad. I've rewarded their good, I've, 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 I've discouraged their good behavior. On the flip side, I have an agency that's stuck their head in the sand, isn't even doing endpoint, and it's easier for them because they get to implement the one. What we've said is we got to support both. 
We go into these agencies who are, you know, 20 years behind, 10 years behind, five years behind on a cyber hygiene and capabilities to protect state data. And we bring them the solutions to, to move them 20, 10, 15, five years ahead. Simultaneously to the ones that have been trying and are moving, let's meet them where we are in this integrated marketplace so that we kind of achieve that cliched, but, but, but not cliched when you live at center of excellence, where we are governing the entire enterprise, we are setting those standards, we are buying more intelligently than the state has ever bought, um, and we're demonstrating significant returns, 25% and $4 million on one purchase alone that could be reinvested right back into the operation. So uh, another one that could probably be double-clicked, and, and there's a lot there, so sorry if I'm giving you too much, but, but it, you're touching on the, the hardest part of the job for sure. It's the people, it's not the tech. No, look, I think I think what you say about standards makes a tremendous amount of sense. And look, I think more and more organizations, whether they're um, a public sector or even commercial, right, are really kind of amalgams of different departments, lines of business, and creating efficiencies, especially in this economy, is not unique to just a state or federal um, agency, I think, or government. I think it's, it's something that I think a lot of people need to start embracing. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about standards, and, um, you know, I think that kind of brings us to maybe kind of regulated data. So you, you mentioned that you previously worked in a healthcare company, obviously number of regulations cover them, HIPAA being probably the most familiar where you're kind of yeah. dealing with the sensitive patient data. Um, what are the regulations from a data perspective that you think about? And I know that Florida, you know, is at the forefront, hopefully there'll be a, a new privacy regulation uh, coming out shortly. So what are the things that you care about and how do you deal with them? Um, so I'm, I'm pausing for a second to figure out if my, my answer is a non-answer or an actual answer, uh, because, I, because I'm trying to answer, Dimitri. So, yeah. so one, one, one thing I'll say that, that might transition from the last question to this question as a little bit of a bridge. Um, uh, you know, I've been in a situation where you're up all night doing board reports on a venture-backed P&L, and when you're in that situation, you sit there and you go, man, I just hope one day I'd never have to deal with a P&L, and hope I'd never have a, 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 the venture backing and all the pressure that comes with it. And I've come to learn in this job that far harder than the most pressure-packed venture P&L that any of my friends or myself have ever had to deal with, far more difficult than that is an ecosystem that has no P&L, right? And if you really make the transition from the private sector to government, one of the things that I think is, is I've just over the last two plus years in this job, trying to understand that, that trying to remember that incentive structures are undefeated for, for all of humanity, and if you understand that the inf that the incentive structure of government incentivizes no, then you can start to do reform. In the agency world, when you say, hey, do you want to modernize? The incentive is for the agency personnel to say no. In the agency world, when the question is, hey, do you want to do data sharing across multiple agencies? The answer is, or the incentive is no. Because no means I take less risk. No means I do less work. No means I have less chance of getting fired. No means I don't have to do uh, around the clock work. All, all those things. In the private sector, we have ways to incentivize you to get to yes for doing those work, right? Um, and the reason I say that is that, that now when you come over to these regulations, the biggest challenge I find with the regulation, uh, CGIS, criminal justice information systems, is probably the most pervasive Inside of government, HIPAA is probably number two, but that that kind of CGIS, HIPAA, DIPA, FERPA, alphabet soup of you know education, healthcare, criminal justice, um, those all tend to get used as uh, Heisman trophies, right? They tend to be the thing that somebody says, "Oh, gee, that sounds good." Unfortunately, CGIS won't let us do that. HIPAA won't let us do that. The the last thing I'll say on that front, and then and then maybe get to an answer because I, I might have I'm, I'm not trying to dodge your question. I promise I'm trying to give the biggest challenge of those regulations that comes up is the lack of data sharing agreements. One of the things I'm most proud of the, of the DeSantis administration, and I and I give all credit to the governor on this because uh, it wouldn't have happened without uh, his leadership and his backing. Like most of the stuff we've gotten done warp speed in the last couple of years, is we now have data sharing agreements with every uh, agency that is a part of the executive. Okay. And that's that other regulation that prevents the data sharing. So um, let's make it real for a second. And when I say the regulation, it's what somebody throws up, right? The the agency yeah. that doesn't want to participate at, at like the CIO level or somewhere says, oh, gee, we'd love to, but C just won't let us and we don't have a data sharing agreement, so we can't do X. Now, let me make X personal and real because because this is what will be the first publicly uh, I've, I've told my team, as soon as we get into API, we get through the data catalog work we're doing right now, and we start publishing uh, API capabilities across state government, the first one we're going to solve 
is the fact that a registered sex offender and a foster child have been put in the same home on numerous occasions in Florida's history over the last 30 years. And the way that happens, and, and in at least two of those situations that I'm aware of, uh, the sex offender's record had the same address as the applicant to be the foster parent or the foster child delivery was going to happen. Okay. It happens because two totally different agencies have 123 Main Street as part of a record. In one case, it's a sex offender. And in the other case, it's a foster applicant, foster parent applicant, or it's the address to be of the foster child. And a simple API call doesn't say, hey, these two things can't coexist. So, so when some of these folks like to throw up the, well, I'd like to, but CGIS, or I'd like to, but HIPAA, or I'd like to, but I don't have a data sharing agreement, understanding that we have to comply with the law. And one of the things that I tell my team all the time is show me the law. Don't come back to me and tell me we can't. Show me the law and let's figure out how to get to yes within the law. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, no matter what your perspective of government is, I think we can all agree it should, should be big enough to keep a foster child and a sex offender from living together. I would hope so. I would hope so. <laughs> that certainly makes a lot of sense. So, and look, and, and, you know, I think that makes it quite real, right? I think you, you don't always translate it as simply in terms of some of the ramifications for getting data wrong. Uh, you know, I want to touch on something a little bit uh, unrelated and more kind of from an infrastructure. So I just uh, returned from um, AWS reInvent, obviously cloud, cloud is uh, the primary focus there. Uh, what we see on the commercial side is a lot of companies are moving towards kind of a cloud first strategy. Uh, you, you told me at the very beginning that you still have some mainframes lying around in the basement of one of the government government buildings. You know, where are you on that um, cloud journey and, and how does that impact your thinking around data security? Does it change it at all? It, it, um, it does, right? So, so a couple things I would say to, to kind of maybe bullet point of where we are on our cloud journey. Um, and, and one of the parallels I, I, when I when I you know kind of went from from saying no to yes on this appointment and and moving from Tampa to Tallahassee and you know the, the fun pay cuts that come when you go into government and all the the challenges that come with a role like this, one of the things I kind of quite frankly relished was that I, I truly believe Florida, which post COVID is probably somewhere between the tenth and twelfth largest economy in the world, we'd be a member of the G twenty pre COVID and post COVID if we were a sovereign nation. Um, and, and currently about $112 billion enterprise at the state level, we were the first state to really embrace cloud from a CGIS perspective. Okay. So when you talk about some of the historical challenges, like you had agencies or uh, in, at that time, me as a legislator trying to drive cloud adoption, uh, while you still had people in government saying, no, I want to be building my own software. I want to be maintaining on-premise um, and cloud bad. And so if we flash from, you know, maybe three, five, 10 years ago over that journey to the last two plus years that this administration has been uh, moving the digital service forward, uh, we are about to be one of the first multi-cloud states in the country as far as enterprise agreements with all three of the big three and growing. So open invitation to um, cloud service providers that want to have an enterprise agreement with the state. Some of that is procurement reform to understand that, like, you know, if you're in the business of selling cloud, you care about consumption. I can't give you, you know, $20 million of consumption tomorrow. So I don't expect the discounts of $20 million, but I do expect kind of, I call it the MailChimp model from, you know, 10, 10 12 years ago, where as consumption goes up, my, my price per unit goes down. I know that people want to have Florida's logo and, and we should be buying like Florida's logo matters, we should also have the humility to understand that you're not going to get enterprise discounts until you deliver enterprise adoption. And how do you have that partnership? Now, why that matters, Dimitri, is, you know, I pulled, uh, our team pulled, uh, you know, in uh, right out of a year ago, actually about a year and 10 days ago or so, uh, we pulled a report of the state data center at the time and the numbers of end of life hardware and un unsupported software, staggering, huh. absolutely staggering. Now, I kind of glossed over the difference between capital expenditures and operational expenditures and, and, and shifting from a CapEx model to a OpEx model. But like the fundamental question is, can government in Tallahassee, Florida, um, recruit, retain, and build a workforce necessary to do DevSecOps and then do infrastructure management? And I just don't believe that's possible. And why would I want to compete with AWS or GCP or Azure or Snowflake or any of these other companies that are starting to do cloud work where their P&L, their share price, their uh, job, their livelihood pretends, uh, depends on 
um, developing something the customer finds value in and then securing that thing. So for me, um, I don't think, you know, everything is, is necessarily cloud. Like I understand there are some situations where on premise uh, it might make sense in some situations. Um, and I'm open to not having a hundred percent policy everywhere, but our very, very strong presumption is get government into the business of hosting with people whose livelihood and profession depend on hosting, i.e. cloud, yep. and, and securing. And so we're trying to drive very hard. Now we have um, the, the legislature this year at the governor's uh, re request has made historic investments in cybersecurity, a lot of that driving towards cloud solutions and, and, and COTS solutions, the acronym for commercial uh, off the shelf, but, but a SaaS world that's hosted by cloud. Um, we've got to get there on retiring legacy systems and migrating to the cloud. We have the money to do it. We're just kind of kicking off, getting agencies to go, hey, what can you retire? What can you modernize? Um, and, and, and I'll make a plug for the team here at the digital service, Dimitri, for a second, but the work we did as is, is part of the hurricane response and, and in the pandemic showed what happens when you take the speed limits of government off and demonstrated what could be built for less than $10 million that, that you know, a typical appropriation or procurement in government would have at north of $100 million by the time all those things that, that drive those costs up get there. So short order is we're very bullish. Short order is we've made tremendous progress and historic progress. Uh, conclusion, we still have a lot of hard work to go to make sure that the state doesn't go backwards. Well, it sounds like you got four more years to to work on it. So <laughs> that's the good news. So uh, you got a mandate. And and look, as a, as a recent uh, uh, immigrant from New York, uh, to Florida. It sounds uh, all pretty good to me. So that's fantastic. So uh, look, I think this has been a fantastic interview. It's been great to get your point of view, uh, Jamie, because again, it's something that I think our audience doesn't really hear enough about. Uh, and I do think some of what you're bringing from the private sector to the public sector, I think is fascinating, as well as just the embrace of the latest technologies, because believe it or not, I actually, I had to learn how to program in, in Fortran and COBOL way back when uh, I'm, I'm that old. Um, but obviously I still have a tech company and it's, uh, and it's great to see kind of a state move the times as well. So, um, so thank you again for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you, Jamie. Happy, uh, happy to be here. If I can ever be a help, you know, one of the things I'd say in closing is like, it, it, it should be easier to do business with government. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that tech companies have to have a sled division for state, local and education to be a totally different sales and account management department from the rest of their revenue generating organization, um, is just something that drives me batty. And so we're not going to solve all the problems here. Um, I, I can promise you that we're not going to play scared. I drill into our team that the worst thing that happens in roles like this is you get fired and you get a 10 X pay raise, uh, for your next gig. So, so don't be scared take advantage of the opportunity. That's why we had the biggest Starlink deployment uh, outside of a war zone in the span of four days and, and the, the first ever in response to natural disaster. Uh, it's, it's the executive backing we have and then the willingness to, to be innovative and to take risk and to own up when we make mistakes, but kind of keep 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 the ball moving. So it, it takes all of us and, and, and maybe Dimitri, if I could scream one more time, we're recruiting a chief data officer and two, we have to get this mission accomplished with the private sector. So that partnership mentality, um, it is just something that's huge uh, for us. It's why we developed something called the CoLab that's now about 50 different companies presenting to state government at no cost, over 600 government employees attending those events to, to do everything from project management, change transformation, uh, leadership, but also technical cloud security, those kind of things. So we got a lot going on. There's a lot to be bullish on in Florida. We want to see more people migrating here. I truly believe Florida and the, the, the innovation that Florida can drive can lead the next hundred years in this country. And, and I'll put it on a map this way for you. If you want big, here's big. Only one state in the country has CENTCOM and SOCOM that sits inside of it. That's the state of Florida. Only one state in, in, in the country has the NAP of the Americas sitting right down the road from you. And only one state has Cory Station and Homeland Security and what happens in Pensacola, the home of cryptology. If we'll connect those dots, we can change the, the future of this country and, and see the next frontier of innovation happening inside the third largest state in America. So I'm really glad to have you here. Let's get some of your friends here uh, and, and I'm here to help. Yeah, and I'll just leave you with this one, one final thought. I think uh, two and a half years ago, we had no employees in Florida. Today, we have about 30 out of uh, about 500. And so we're definitely growing our footprint and it's exciting to hear everything. You know, I've never actually heard that summer, uh, summarize. Uh, Jamie, thank you again. Uh, this will be fantastic. I will... Uh, 
circle back with you. I may have a candidate for you on the, on the CDO side. Uh, and I may double click. We may have a follow on just to talk about what you guys did around Starlink because that sounds pretty interesting too. So thank you again. Would, would love to. Thanks, Dimitri.